Hey, welcome to Hackless Talk, the podcast of the hottest blockchain news, market insights, and expert opinions from web free professionals, brought to you by Hackless. I'm your host, Eugene A.K. Crypto Amsui, and I'm here today with two very smart cybersecurity and smart contract audit guys. First of all, welcome Jay Kuo, blockchain security auditor and senior research engineer at QuantStamp. And QuantStamp is the leader of blockchain security, having performed over 250 audits and secured over 200 billions in value. Welcome, Jake. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having me on the show. And I'm having Paolo Horbanos. He is the technical advisor of Hackless. So, Paolo, great to have you. Yeah, thank you. Glad to join. It's always better to start with the personal history of our distinguished speaker. And today, Jake is here. So, Jake, First question comes to you. How did you start in the crypto space and how did you become a QuantStop team member? <laughs> well, to, to trace the origin from where I started in crypto all the way to QuantStop will, will take pretty long, but I'll give you the quick shot. Um, well, I got into crypto around 2011, 2012. Uh, the same reason why most people around 2011, 2012 got into it in the first place. We heard about this, uh, this article, I think, by TechCrunch. It's talking about the Silk Road, the original Silk Road. And there was this idea of, oh, if you want to be on a Silk Road, which is the Amazon for drugs and everything else, you got to know this thing called Bitcoin. And then from then on, you know, I entered into this world of Bitcoin, where it was just like Bitcoin markets and Bitcoin on Reddit, you know, where it was uh, a picture of Gandalf holding a, <laughs> a, a staff going like uh, magic into that money. So it's, it started all the way from those days. Um, along the way, you know, I, I, I was always in and out of the, of the industry, but not quite so because I was still very much a student and not even in college back then. I don't think I've even written a line of code back when I found Bitcoin a long time ago. Uh, I got into computer science and I got into more things. I went to a university that was actually very into blockchain research. I was in UNUS college uh, and NUS college, the mother college was very into blockchain research. And so, you know, I helped out there and I interned there along the way. I worked more projects and I was one of the first to write some smart contracts here and there. And then from then on, Ethereum Foundation were in Singapore uh, and they were in Asia and they were looking for researchers. And I was like, hey, what about me? <laughs> you know, so from then on, I started working with the foundation and I started working for more firms here and there. I just kept growing and growing from here. And uh, I think it was uh, July, two years ago, yeah, when Quantstem were looking for someone uh, who was looking for someone to do some part-time work. And around that time, I was kind of in my sabbatical mode, also in the whole COVID, I don't want to work anymore kind of mode. I decided to do a bit of part-time work for them. I decided, you know what, this is pretty fun. So I carried on and two years later, I'm here talking to you right now. Amazing. What excites you most in web free space? Because the vast majority of our listeners, perhaps maybe they, they consider smart contracts out a so boring thing <laughs> just checking the code uh, isn't boring at what we answer. I, I wouldn't say it's boring at all if you know what you're doing. It's kind of like when people say, oh, mathematics is so boring, but it's only because you don't quite get mathematics or you don't quite understand what happens at a higher level where it's more of an art, right? I would say like, yeah, you know, for a lot of smart contract audits, uh, if you're looking at the same thing over and over again, the same ERC-20, yeah, it gets boring after a while because you're just fat checking certain things, right? But one of the great things about being in STEM is that we get to look at the state of the art projects by a lot of different things from different areas of the space, be it from DeFi, NFT, and also. So you're constantly like being challenged by what are the new ideas right now, what are new paradigms, what are new patterns that people decide to write code in. And it becomes very interesting and very intriguing because it's no longer just like, oh, uh, here's my code, check what errors there is, and please tell me to not get hacked. It's more like, hey, uh, we've written these things, we've tried these things, can you give us a take on this, review this for us as well, tell us whether there's some better design. So like, along the way, I kind of found out that, um, you know, a lot of people say like, yeah, if you become a smart contract reviewer or auditor, you kind of lose your skills and all that. But I found out after two years later, where I've been writing code for like a year, I got a lot better because I was always reading the best and always interacting with like the best minds who were like coming out of this new code, you know? So it's pretty fun that way. Uh, I, I hope that answers your question on uh, whether smart contract audits are boring. And the answer to that is definite no. Definitely. <laughs> I'm I think one... it's, we also can say that while you are auditing the contract, uh, you are not writing the code, but you make the code perfect. You make it better. Yeah. And thus you can bring more ideas and test uh, like more interesting stuff to make it work 
perfectly as you want it to work. Exactly. So, guys, exactly. the question from I am not a technical guy, guy at all. What's more interesting to write a code or to audit some other code? Perhaps the, the answers will be different from uh, <laughs> I'll say this, the answer is more in between the two of them, actually. I mean, anyone could be a code monkey and just write a bunch of code and that goes nowhere, right? But at the same time, it's like, it gets boring after all if you're only looking at code and not thinking so much about it. I'll say that in the in-between part is about thinking very hard about it, thinking about edge cases, you know, finding out what's the business to use and finding out what's the actual logical cases being written down and trying to match them. Trying to figure out, especially like when we're working on smart contracts and on things that requires a lot more fine tuning when it comes to like execution costs and all that. And to have to think on that level is actually very interesting. Um, so I would say like it's the in-between, it's the really thinking about it, it's the pushing the edge of it that, that makes it fun for me. Oh, well, and what about you? What's more interesting for you to write a code or to do all these and other code? Yes, for me, I think that auditing the code is just uh, like the best activity for the blockchain engineer because, uh, as said, it allows to uh, test a lot of ideas, to learn a lot of interesting stuff. And actually, from my uh, personal point of view, it actually gives the most boost for your growth as a developer. Uh, just after some time uh, of performing audits. So yeah, it's definitely auditing. <laughs> Amazing. Some of our listeners are wondering, uh, is it hard to be a blockchain security auditor, Jake? Or in other words, how is your typical working day looking like? Hmm. Well, is it hard to be a security auditor? It's, it's kind of a very loaded and difficult question to answer. <laughs> it's kind of like, is it, is it hard doing mathematics? Well, for some people, it's really hard because they're, they're not geared to us and they don't quite like thinking like that. Um, but is it hard starting out from like, you know, completely fresh in college to be a smart contract auditor? Yeah, I would say there is because um, you typically need a bit of deaf experience to kind of understand what you're trying to catch and look at as well. I mean, I'm sure you can jump right into it if you're a very like sufficiently motivated person, uh, just like what Pavlo was saying, you know, it makes you a much better developer and a much better um, uh, thinker in the blockchain space, definitely when you have to interact with a lot of smart contract audits. Uh, but to jump into that from the beginning is actually not that easy, I would say. Um, and to your second question with regards to uh, what do I do in my regular day? Uh, well, we go by regular weeks, really. In, in quantum time, we think about things in terms of more weeks. And, you know, I start my week on a Monday. You know, I, I would usually have to understand what assignment I'm going to work on, really. I would usually try to ramp up or understand what I'm going to look at over the weekend. So that I start on a Monday already completely going into it. Um, and then, obviously, I break the code up into um, bite-sized segments in which I choose to crunch through over time. I have a set of boundary over like the time box over how much time I'm going to use for each thing. Uh, but at the same time, I have to leave a big amount of buffer because as Pablo can attest to this as well, uh, with some tricky parts, it takes a bit of creativity to sometimes come up with some kind of a text, which is why I say again, like, it's not boring. Or it's actually a very fun job. <laughs> you spend a lot of hours actually thinking of all the ways you could break into something. Um, so that's what a typical day will look like for me. I, I have like maybe four plus five hours of like work where I, I portion those amount and like three hours or so where I kind of allow myself to free flow and be creative about how I'm looking at this in a practice. Amazing. Yeah. I love and if I may add a few thoughts, so like uh, you must know everything regular blockchain developer know. And yeah. uh, first of all, you must know it better and you must know uh, a bit more stuff because you need like make a review of the code written by any developer. So you uh, a priori need to know more than a regular blockchain developer. And it actually exactly. sets the barrier even higher. Exactly, exactly. And to, to back it up as well, you have to be a particular kind of person. If you want to be a smart contract auditor, you have to be very conscientious and like very diligent and looking at code, you have to really think of all the cases, and and that shrinks the amount of people who can do that to like even small amount of people again. Well, gentlemen, uh, let me ask you about the initial uh, level of literacy of our listeners. Let's give the initial literacy. What is how do you define the term blockchain security, and why does it matter? Well, maybe somebody doesn't even think about it. Jake, let's start with you. 
Uh, you mean how to define the words blockchain security? Blockchain security, yes. Well, in this case, we're talking very much about cybersecurity that happens on the web tree or the web tree to web two interfaces. Uh, so for blockchain security, I would be thinking about anything along the lines of smart contracts, anything along the lines of like layer, the different layer interactions, you know, I'm thinking about the layers itself. Um, and I'm thinking also sometimes about interfaces and more and more so conversations are moving on to that. But yeah, typically most people would regard it as just things around the smart contract layer or the application layer. Well, Paul, would you like to add something? How do you define the term blockchain security and why does it matter? Oh, it's actually like the point for the whole dispute because uh, from my point of view, it's hard to define blockchain security for just uh, like to narrow it for some region. Because if we talk about smart contract security, so we have like a bunch of tools for formal checking, for testing, like fuzzy testing, a lot of auditors tools and so on. But actually it's only a part of the blockchain security because we also have attacks on validators, attacks from infrastructure level, uh, hacks from the traditional web two directions. So actually uh, each, it is hard to define blockchain security from the a particular point of view because it should unite uh, a lot of directions because attack can come from uh, anywhere. And so uh, different teams of security engineers uh, should handle uh, different aspects where the software work. So it's hard to, to answer this question like in short. Okay, we won't deep dive in. Let's uh, take the term security audit. What, what is it, how it looks like, and how it goes from A to Z, from the first to the last stage, Jake? What do you mean from the first to the last stage? How it starts, how it goes, how it ends. What are the stages of, of the security audit? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, well... To, to go abstractly about this, uh, all security auditing firms, I think, complies with a certain format like follows, right? Um, you have to take, you have to understand where the code is actually living at, the repo link, and you have to take a particular commit hash for that to kind of lock in at what stage of the code we're looking at right here. Because when you're auditing a piece of code, you have to audit something that is no longer just iterating and, and testing out and moving forward. You have to say, at this point, this is the code we're looking at. Um, so usually all auditing firms will start from that point. And then you will have, um, well, in this case, let us think of a case of a single auditor just looking at this. Then what an audit actually takes place is that I will look at that code about what is included, excluded from what you want me to look at. I look at the documentation and the different spec and from your description to me as what this product is supposed to be. And ideally I have a full spec to really comply with this. But if not, I would have to make some level of guesswork to really understand what you're optimizing for, what you're trying to really do. Um, and then from that moment on, there are two steps forward, right? One is I use the suite of tools which are available, which I may, have, may or may not have developed myself already to test out certain inferences. I may do some fuzzing if there's enough time for me to do this. On the other hand, uh, we, most auditors and myself included, we do what is called white gloving, which is that we actually go through the code and go through line by line of it and to look at every method and how they interact with each other and to see whether there are any things that could break any of the specification or any of the um, invariants which we are given from the beginning. And after which, obviously, we try to make clever guesses of what other invariants or what other properties should be available for the system. And we try to break them bit by bit or to assure them or to find some kind of uh, informal proof that, hey, you know what? I've checked through all the externals that interacts with this and I know that nothing is going to ha happen on this pathway. Um, so that's what kind of what a smart contract uh, audit is on like the end of uh, the white gloving part. And then from there on, it's just about making that more human readable uh, or like readable to the dev on the other side so that they can fix the issues or any best practices we should discover. So that for me is what a smart contract audit is, at least um, from get go to the end. And it complies quite well with the process we have here in Quantstem. Well, how many time and money, of course, a uh, typical smart contract audit takes or will take? Or will take. Sorry? Say again? Uh, how much time and money uh, typical <laughs> security audits will consume? May you answer in general terms? <laughs> 
Yeah, um, in terms of the time, right? On average, I could say that um, 95% of cases, so two sigma of cases, they will fall between like one to two weeks in terms of completion. And then you have obviously the much, much longer cases uh, for audits. Uh, I'm not just talking about smart contracts anymore. I'm also including audits for like uh, layer ones, like if uh, 2.0, like a Solana, like AVAX and all that, that could take like weeks up to months, right? And over here in Constant, we do all kinds of audits over here. Um, but yeah, and in terms of cost, well, that's not something I can just give to you over at a podcast. But I would say that it definitely ranges between the different companies. And I would say that there are different tiers as well when it comes to um, the pricing and the tier one firms like ourselves, OpenZap and Trail of Beats, uh, it's been pretty consistent, you know? So that's what I can say with regards to like the resources and uh, the time needed for an audit. Great. Paul, do you have something to add to the answer? Uh, actually, it's quite comprehensive because uh, it actually, yes, one, two weeks for uh, roll uh, general checks for checking for security, but actually there are times when uh, it takes longer because uh, auditors stuck with some specific kind of attack trying to reproduce it. And in most cases, even uh, successfully reproducing the attack. And so uh, spend a lot of time for proving it for the customer because uh, we cannot just say that uh, here you have some unsafe code. We actually have also to prove it. So we, we should uh, add some explanation for it, recommendation for fixes. And sometimes the explanation and proof uh, takes a form of uh, a bunch of tests, which can be written during like a week or two in order to prove some specific attack, which is very important for the protocol. Uh, but from other sides, yeah, Jake is totally right. <laughs> that is how it goes. Well, then yeah. I'll love to ask you about how to choose a smart contract or auditor or advisor, uh, auditor. I don't know exactly, are Hackless and Quantum competitors or not? Maybe probably you may clarify me. Are you competitors or you're? Uh, I may I may say that we work in the same security niche, so okay. we are not competitors. <laughs> but actually, it will be good if protocols will take both approaches to make uh, the security even stronger for the protocol. Okay, so, yeah. so the question comes for for both of you: How to choose uh, a great smart contract auditor from the old competitors who are operating on the markets? Jake, how would you say? Or, How would you pick a smart contract auditor uh, based yeah, on or why, 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 why should we choose QuantStamp for smart <laughs> uh, Because we're really nice people, really awesome. <laughs> but uh, I, I would say just generally, just not talking just from QuantStamp's perspective, because uh, uh, this is uh, why I like I enjoy being QuantStamp as well. We take the biggest perspective around it. I don't think that we always try to push for, for hours in, in itself as much as the entire security field by itself. Um, and also to, uh, to answer public question from the beginning, like I, I don't think that um, we are competitors in the sense of like, I think that there's always a win-win situation for the two firms of Hackless and Constant. So, and that's, that's why we're collaborating on this and that's why we're collaborating on a bunch of things as well. Uh, but I'll say to pick a smart contract auditor or the auditing firm, well, the first thing you have to realize is that most of the tier one firms like ourselves, OpenZap and all that, we're pretty much booked out for like weeks, right? So you have to understand what your timeline fits into the entire thing first. Um, so obviously it's a good thing to reach out to everyone just to have an idea of who's available or who's not. And then from then onwards, uh, you have to understand as well, like whether this firm has the niche to audit what it is you're looking for. Obviously, if you're looking for a very standard EVM uh, audit, I think most firms, you know, all firms can off offer to do this right now. But for instance, over in Quantstem, like we've been building out, let's say a Solana team and a Substrate team for like the longest time. We have like been hiring Rust developers for this reason. So you might want to understand if like the firm has the niche or has the support staff to kind of do what you need. Uh, I've been getting like requests for orders with regards to just general cryptographic protocols as well, or things around applied cryptography. And that is something that obviously we have some strength in, but I wouldn't say like we are the most appropriate people. But obviously, like we have like a queue for that, and take, it takes a pretty long time for us. So I think in terms of finding out whether there is a possibility for an audit that takes place in your timeline, it's very very important. Um, 
And then from then onwards, it's really looking at their body of work and looking at the auditors that they have and to assess on that basis, you know. Obviously, it's, I would say it's kind of hard for newer firms to kind of break and be like, hey, we don't have body of work and all that. Um, that's when like the auditor's experience and the auditor's experience in regards to the developer's experience and the audit experience will come in, will come in play a lot. Um, but I would say beyond that, um, it is to really talk to your auditors and to talk to the BD that's handling you and to understand whether it's been an ideal experience for you uh, from the beginning onwards. Uh, because uh, like why, like you asked me the question, why come to Quantstem? Well, it's because in Quantstem over here, we actually believe that we, we want everyone to be happy, to be working with us uh, from the beginning towards the end. And we kind of prioritize a lot. So um, this is something that we want any of them. We want happy customers, we want happy clients, we want happy people to work with us. Um, and that is something I would say I would push as a factor to how to pick a good smart contract auditor, because I feel like at a certain level, you're pretty much looking at everyone being somewhat the same when it comes to auditing skills and, and levels. Obviously, we have a lot more experience and that's why people come to us, right? But I would say in terms of technical levels, the technical difference, uh, I wouldn't say that there's a very big difference amongst like the top 20th percentile of like all of our companies, you know? So from that, on, from that looking onwards, you're really looking at like what is the most ideal experience you get. Yeah, got it. Paul, how would you answer how to choose the uh, right smart contract? Uh, well, Jake has said a lot about uh, how to choose the auditor. I think uh, the only thing I can add, uh, look uh, on the, look at the reports, because almost yes. every uh, auditor uh, auditor's firm posts their own reports, uh, reports done by, the, by their uh, specialists. And actually, it's the first green flag if the auditor firm has portfolio. So you can take the report and read it. And yep. uh, it actually gives a lot of information because you can see a comprehensive experience in the written form. And the uh, report always reflects of how the auditor's company uh, treats customers because it should contain uh, a lot of explanations, a uh, list of tools, uh, a lot of recommendations, and uh, is actually uh, targeted on the customer. So this is the scene I can add. Look at the report yeah. the auditors produce. Yeah, actually, Pavel touched on a really good point. Like the report part is something I missed out. So thank you for adding that, Pavel. Like really, like you can look into the level of detail that companies put into the report and the kind of issues they find and how, and you can have an idea of their technical diligence and level just by looking at the report. And finally, one thing I want to add is that um, uh, at Quantstem at least, and I've, I see a lot of other auditors as well, we write the report not just for our clients, obviously it's public facing, it's for our clients to understand, but at the end of the day, it's also for the users, like the public users to understand, hey, you're using this protocol right now, you're using these smart contracts right now, what are the things you need to look out for? And we try to break it down in a way that a normal person can read normal English, <laughs> as we call it, while at the same time retaining like technical facts and diligence enough that anyone could really pick it up and be like, hey, I know what you're talking about over here. So yeah, reports are definitely a very, very big one. Yeah, well, it's actually a good point because uh, good auditor reports is one more scene for the users to actually pick the protocol. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it should be written not just for the customer, but for potential community as well. Yeah. Well, Jim, please clarify one great question for me. I'm super curious in one thing. From the one side, we have more than 100 layer first blockchains. If you follow the blockchaincomparison.com website, they are listed there. From the other side, we know that such a thing like a blockchain trilemma exists, decentralization, scalability, and security. And every one of them have already promised that they have successfully mm, completed this blockchain trilemma. That's blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So uh, how to choose the right layer first blockchain from the security standpoint? How would you answer? Hmm. How do I choose the best L1 blockchain from the security standpoint? Is it? Yes. Taking into account that blockchain trilemma exists and nobody may can solve it because this is the trilemma. Sure. Hmm. Well, to, to pick on what you're saying with regards to how do I choose something just from a strict criteria of security, right? 
we have to identify or understand what security means over here, which uh, it's not too clear from what you're saying to me, right? Because uh, so far we've been talking about security at least on the application level. Right now we're talking about security on the on the layer level, or at least the L1 level, right? Um, and one of the things for me, um, well, two things over here I'll look at uh, before picking up uh, L1 based on security. First, I'll look at what is the consensus uh, mechanism uh, and I'll obviously challenge that and to look into how secure that really is, or at least what are the security assumptions uh, that is provided by the uh, consensus mechanism and to see if there is something that will mesh out with the criteria of what I'm looking at as I'm choosing a place to land my application in. Um, because you're saying strictly I'm choosing just for security. I know most companies they say they don't choose by that. They choose by what is the lowest gas, <laughs> what is the lowest execution cost I can find uh, and where I like, where's everyone uh, currently at right now. Um, and on the second thing is I'll look at is I will definitely look into who's audited their runtime um, code and also any code they have around their L1 execution levels. Um, and if I could peek into that myself, I'll do that too. Um, and the third factor, I'll look into this. Uh, yeah, I'll say this too for now. Is how I will look into it. Great. Paul, how would you answer on this? Oh, I question? think, uh, yeah, my approach is very strict. Uh, you have mentioned like three uh, stones of each blockchain. So actually only scalability is the one that can be measured by some uh, uh, adequate points. So we probably can let it live by uh, itself so it can be evaluated for somehow. Uh, as for security, uh, I think it's best to see if the chain uh, has been already hacked because uh, it may be the destiny of almost each blockchain because we do remember DDoS on Solana, we do remember problems uh, on Ronin network, we do remember problems with Polygon security. Uh, like there is uh, no enough insurance for each level, level <laughs> one blockchain. So actually if blockchain was already hacked, uh, most of all, I will not choose it. Uh, from <laughs> other points of view, I'm quite open. open. And as for decentralization, well, uh, it brings some yes, it brings some no, because uh, like you can rely on true decentralized blockchains if you are a true uh, decentralized person, let's uh, say in this way. Uh, so there are a lot of people who will not choose, for example, the non-smart chain for some reason, which- This is not, not true decentralized terms. Uh, but uh, decentralization is actually also a very valuable point because it shows from one point of how secure your own funds are on the chain. But from another point of how much help will you get from the community in order to return these funds. So it's actually quite a trick question. But from other sides, uh, if blockchain was not hacked yet and it has good ecosystem and good bridges to another chains, I will probably choose it. Yeah, Paul, let me clarify. Yeah. You said uh, which are true decentralized. Please name some exact blockchains which are not true decentralized. You name Binance. We know what else? Uh, yeah, because actually there are not enough validators for the non smart chain. So like le level of trust uh, it has some consequences, let's say it's, uh, it's such way. Uh, well, uh, I do not want to blame other chains, uh, but uh, I will look very, uh, uh, like very close on chains which have a uh, very low number of validators. Like let's talk about EOS, let's talk about Telos and other chains where you have only few, uh, sometimes few dozens of validators. I do not name them truly decentralized. Uh, as said, uh, it has some cons, it has some pros. Uh, it's deci the decision is up for the users. So we, we are not here to judge. Okay, this yeah. is a topic for now. And, 
I, I think there's something I want to add as well with regards to um, looking at the developer's environment and the history of it as well. Uh, for instance, if I was launching something and Solana just released like their yeah, runtime just a while back, you know, I would actually not feel as safe, even though it would be very exciting to the hacker in me to want to release something on Solana, just because like there's been no body of works out there. There's been no body of hacks out there. There's been this entire fluff area like that I have no idea what's going on. Whereas like if I look at what's been happening on EVM or EVM based systems, I know, oh, there's this histories of hacks. People have been surfacing and attacking all these things. And therefore I feel somewhat good because at least we've discovered at least 80% of the issues which should be uncovered or could be uncovered already. So I think this is something to take note yes, of in which that if you're joining an ecosystem that's completely fresh and new, that's great. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of chances. You could be the first uh, compound. You could be the first Ave whatsoever. But you also have to understand that when you're in a completely new um, developer's environment, then all these different surfaces have not really been well researched on yet. And so you could be the first DAO hack. <laughs> so it's one thing to be aware of when you're like thinking of what layer ones to or layer twos to really distribute on. It's like not just thinking of the layer itself, but also like what is the dev environment like. Yeah. Paolo, I know you have a couple of uh, great professional questions from your side. So Jake, please proceed. Yeah, actually, we have uh, touched the surface of these questions because uh, my questions are, let's say, uh, general about the security sphere. Because the first one is uh, about your vision of how blockchain security sphere will evolve. What new uh, possible directions will it achieve? Like what new uh, surfaces will, will it touch? Because as we know, it's not only the smart contracts audits, not only like layer one audits, or uh, not only monitoring tools, but it actually can become something more in order to bring like really secure solutions uh, into the sphere. So what's your vision on the uh, security segment of blockchain industry and its uh, future way? Hmm. So... I feel like you're, you might be asking me in regards to what other things we could look into working on or researching into beyond what we're doing right now. Uh, whereas the first half of what you're asking me actually brought up to a different question in my head of like, oh, what should a security, uh, uh, what should a future security look like? And I have a different answer to that. Uh, well, for that, for that one, actually, I think I, I've, been, I've been thinking about this and discussing a lot of people in different conferences more and more. And I see that there, there is a need almost like there should be a push for making security more of a public good when it comes to uh, what's happening in the blockchain space right now. Because essentially right now what you have is that um, you have people who can write code and maybe people who can throw out businesses and they can run out DAOs and throw everything, but they're always stopped at a sort of funnel, funneling point, right? And the funneling point is that they need to pay a shit ton of money or they need to know someone to get a slot within one of the auditing companies like myself or you guys or the rest of them so that they could get this check mark before they can be a legitimate company after that. Because everybody knows if you're not audited, then you're not really legitimate in some sense. <laughs> and so that, that almost feels like there should be a, a need for some kind of, um, uh, that the system in itself, right? It's not gonna eat very well because you're just gonna have a system where only those who can pay for an audit um, are able to get an audit and therefore able to get something out of the way. And this is not going to be great uh, on a security perspective because it's equivalent of like, instead of there being police or anything or any kind of shared public good that we have, we're all just relying on Pinkerton's or like private security to guard us to, to hope that we don't get into fights uh, on the streets outside, you know? So I feel like there's some kind of thinking and some kind of change that will come on that perspective, especially as more regulations come in. I don't quite like the idea of more regulations, but I see that over the last two or three bull cycles, that has become a bit of a problem already with regards to, to, to audits and securities and general growth of things, you know? Uh, with regards to your other question on like, what are the newer things we should look for to make the space more secure? Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of work done with regards to formally formal verification of at least the more simple um, protocols we're using, like because the RC20 and everything else. I think there's a there's a step in a good way. Um, although I feel like there is this like two school of thoughts when it comes to security or securing things right now that we're doing right. 
there is one which is the complete lockdown, formally verified, deterministic, um, everything is cryptographic verified, mathematically verified, and this is like completely true. And then there's the other idea of the other head of like, hey, we can do things optimistically. We can trust that most people will behave in a particular way and we can think about things in this way. Uh, and so I think that there will be more nuanced uh, security theories and principles and indication grown onto the optimistic part. As much as I think that there will be more grown into like trying to make things more locked down, more secure for everyone by default, more formally verified, as we're talking about in this perspective. Um, on the more short term, in terms of what I think are more interesting things to look at, I think that the cross-chain world and the multi-chain world is growing, growing very fast. And the surface area for attacks are growing every day. And I feel the anxiety just by looking at all this money and all these things we've got throwing into without thinking so much about it. And I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, of research into these areas. So that's where I can look at in the short, short term. I think I've kind of drifted a bit as I'm talking, so I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> I hope I did. Yeah, have. actually, uh, these are quite interesting thoughts and uh, actually uh, matches a bit for my next question as uh, uh, you lead to the thought that there should be some kind of uh, public security uh, which the protocol can uh, come and pass uh, instead of like uh, taking a paid security mark and uh, I actually just thought about the, uh, some kind of security DAO, some kind of dynamic security. Because, you know, if we talk about audits and security for now, we are actually staying in the some kind of static phase because we need to take the undeployed code. We need to yes. take all instruments we have together with formal verification and so on. And after that, we say this code is secure, please deploy it. Yes. And so like the question is, what about dynamic security? What about the abilities to have security process automated? So the uh, protocol owners deploy their code and then uh, takes us existing online tools or pass uh, already deployed codes to, through some kind of uh, dynamic uh, yeah. frameworks of security like is that actually possible or at least feasible for the current state of uh, blockchain security well i would say that there's already something like that although it's not dynamic it's static we already have like open source tools like slither and MythX and all that to kind of fulfill that space a little bit although we, we both know as, as security experts like this is not enough right um i think what you're talking about is more of like a, a, let's say a generic machine that takes in any bytecode that it, it chunks in and then spits out like oh you have some vulnerability here you have some suspicions over here and i think that that ideal world uh is very possible but much more in the future when like the, the space is more or less stabilized. Like over at Quantum and myself, we have this uh, thesis that we're currently now in 1997, just as in the internet age where we had 1997 before and everything was exciting and growing. We had Joe CDs and Angel Fire and all that. And right now we're at this place where everything is still growing and massively changing all the time, paradigm shifting um, I paradigm shifting um, businesses, ideas are happening all the time. And we are also trying to catch up all the time, right? Like we, I just mentioned, for instance, oh, we have this cross-chain interactions that we need to think about right now, which before we didn't have to consider so much of. So I would say that that war is possible, but it will come not, not anytime soon. Uh, but in terms of like something that um, fulfills the same need, right? Uh, something that's more dynamic. And this is something that we are trying to push for as well. It's also the idea of pushing for in a more optimistic sense. And this, this is what I mean by, uh, what I mean over here is uh, in terms of insurance. So what if auditing firms can actually say, hey, you know what, we checked through this code. Or hey, you know what, we verified this or whatsoever. And it may not be the company paying for it. It's just a, a service where they say, hey, we verified this. And to whoever who wants to use this, we will insure your money up to whatever amount you want to. And so if there's any losses, we'll pay you back. So this actually aligns the incentives in a very right way because auditing firms are actually putting their money where their mouth is over here. Instead of like, we take the money, we tell you how it is, and then we go <laughs> and go away, right? Um, at the same time, this also becomes very dynamic for the user because they can feel very, very safe about it. They know that if a hack does happen, then we'll be insured up to this amount for whatever um, thing that goes on here. So institutional players can actually come in right now can actually feel safer in coming to audit. Because right now, most of us who are using this, we're either like retail folks who are like 
down on using small amounts or like we are freaking apes that are just throwing our life savings into it, right? So it's other one of those two. And there, there's this entire market of like saver players who just want to have an idea of, hey, we want to go into these things. We don't really know how to read uh, audits and reports, but we want to feel safe. We want to have insurance. Can we do this? And this is an option that I think more firms like ourselves, for instance, are releasing now. Like we have Chainproof, which is coming out as our insurance um, uh, site to us that's going to provide for things like this. And I can see more firms that will be looking into this right now because it is a lot more dynamic um, and it is a lot better when it comes to the user's perspective. Yeah. Well, Jim, a couple, couple yeah. of general questions. Finally, lots of so now there are a lot of, Web2 professionals, a lot of professionals who have still been working in Web2 space. Would you suggest them to turn into Web3? And why? <laughs> if you would. Yeah, what are you waiting for, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm... laughs> like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> why? What are the reasons? The what, <laughs> what are three main reasons why to go into Web3 realm from Web2? Uh. I think th there is a lot of blank canvas in the Web3 realm. There's a lot of space that if you're a creative person who is sufficiently uh, clever and you're already technically proficient to a certain level, there's a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of grounds you can make. You don't have to stay in one of the ad companies and continue to make like ad advertisements for like Facebook or <laughs> whatsoever else. Like there is a future where like, you can actually do things which are very intriguing. And I would say that if you're someone who cares about particular issues or missions or things in the world as well, the Web3 world is actually quite exciting because every day we're seeing new DAOs roll out for things. We're seeing new NFT projects roll out for interesting projects. So this could be a way to actually tap into certain other parts of your lives which were not quite aligned with like your Web2 life uh, from before, right? And finally, it's the thing I wanted to say, um, because you're asking me, why is it, why did I come into this space? Why is, why is it so interesting? I actually wanted to answer you this, which is that the Web3 space is just filled with many, many crazy, interesting, like fun people uh, who are all young and motivated and driven to get somewhere to do something. And this is the kind of energy that the internet had back in 1994, 1997 and all that. So... If you want to feel the energy, if you want to be a part of that, if you want to get into the Wild West a little bit in that sense, then the Web3 is definitely here for you. If you want to work in something that is very routinized, that's very set, um, that is very eight to five in a way, that you get a very nice paycheck by the end of the day, um, the Web2 world is pretty nice. It's a pretty sweet game. But the Web3 world is where things get more exciting, where you get to build and you get to um, have ideas a lot more. That's what I would say. Well, Paul, would you suggest? Uh, of course, it's like uh, you uh, come to the uh, production of regular cars and just tell them, hey, guys, let's go build some flying cars. We have money resources. <laughs> Who will agree? Great, great. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, uh, let's suppose that somebody is watching us right now has been absolutely excited, absolutely inspired and amazed with how do you guys love your job? And he wants you to answer. I would, he asked himself or herself, I would love to become a smart security, smart contracts, blockchain auditor. What should I do first? Three, first, second, and third steps. Your suggestions, Jay. I mean, I assume you know how to code, <laughs> right? Because if you yeah. don't know how to code, then yeah. the challenge is pretty, pretty high. Okay. Uh, but if you do, then actually I would just suggest like, if you want to experience what it's like to be uh, an auditor just for a brief second, it's not exactly the case, but I would go to like the eat and not challenges or like the, C the capture the flag CTF challenges that are all around uh, for EVM based uh, programs and, and contracts. And that would be actually a good way to, to look into um, the kind of things we do, which is we look at a piece of code, which looks kind of right sometimes and kind of wrong most of the times, but kind of right sometimes. You smell something is off and you have to kind of realize why do you feel like something is off? Um, and so by playing those challenges, you can get a feel into what it is we do in a small way. And from then on, if you do pretty well in those challenges, then I say, yeah, you can apply to us or apply for someone else. And we have junior roles where we can grow you into to one of me, really. So... Um, yeah, I would try out the CTF and the eat and all challenges and stuff. Well, Paul, would you like to add something? 
Well, we already know that security industry is uh, quite tough. So you need to be ready to solve tough uh, exercises, to solve uh, like very tough problems. And that's like uh, step one. You need to be open for problem solving, for problem solving thinking, because it's not just uh, uh, an implementation of some um, uh, ideas. You are uh, really checking these ideas. Uh, so uh, it's like step one. And actually, it's kind of all steps you need to perform if, because like uh, you can learn how to use MetaMask, you can learn Solidity, you can learn how to code, you can read uh, public uh, uh, registries of vulnerabilities, uh, but uh, if you can't solve problems and if you can't read uh, foreign code, uh, it will be hard uh, to uh, go into the security industry. So be ready to solve problems. Great accommodation, yeah. gentlemen. And finally, these have been recommendations for uh, newcomers into the blockchain audit. And finally, three recommendations from your side to projects who build something in the blockchain space. What should they do or should not they do regarding security issues in the blockchain space or main mistakes? What are we about, like say, Jake? So, sorry, what, what should they do with regards to what? Three main suggestions, three general main recommendations regarding security. Your advisors, you're, because you are <laughs> advisors. For, for project yeah, founders and, and technical Yeah, yeah. The, the, the first one, and it's to, to a very select group, you know who you are. Don't test in prod. <laughs> Just don't do that. <laughs> If you do, then users, please know that they're testing in prod, you know, because a lot can go right, a lot can go wrong. In, right? uh, the second thing is, I, I think this is something that, um, uh, because in the Web2 world, right, especially because of Zuckerberg, we have this idea of like, build fast, break fast, right? And that's not how you want to do things over here in Web3 space. You want to build really slow and iterate really surely. And this is actually one of the biggest tips I can give to any firms who are trying to do this. Like they're always building really fast trying to iterate everything, getting out, everything out in one day without really coming to a design state of really thinking about, hey, how am I going to think about this? What are the edge cases over here? And I find that when you put some time into that, put some time into to writing a specification and documentation, it goes a really long way in securing your, your platform. Um, so that's two. Yeah. The, the third one is really like design it as though you're like trying to build a nuclear reactor of some sort. <laughs> like really think through everything as you're writing it. Work on all the, the developer stuff you do, like writing tests, documentation, all that. That should get you all the way. Really. Amazing final suggestion. Spile, what would you suggest to projects and technical teams regarding security issues finally in this episode of the Hackless Talk? Well, I actually have two advices which I give uh, for all who ask for advices. First of all, read the history from a wrecked history, at least for the half year. <laughs> just, yeah, just learn from another mistake. Uh, just see how uh, the protocol can get wrecked, can get hacked. It's uh, really impressive knowledge to have. And second, learn how the Uniswap works. Just know the basis of the uh, up-to-date uh, DeFi ecosystem. Uh, of course, not just Uniswap, but actually know the basis. Uh, it's uh, even, uh, there is no need to uh, uh, be in hurry. You do not need to take all uh, bleeding edge ideas. Because if you know the foundation and just see how uh, modern ideas uh, has been developed from the foundation, it gives you also very impressive knowledge. So just learn uh, at another mistakes and know your basis of the industry. Amazing, gentlemen. This has been another great, interesting, uh, a lot humoristic, but very important episode of the Hackless Stock podcast about how does blockchain news, market insights, and expert opinions from Web3 Professionals brought to you by Hackless, Jake Guo, Quant Stamp, Paula Harbanos from Hackless, and me, Eugene Crypto MC. Thank you for watching and listening. Please like, share, subscribe, and ask your questions in the comments. Subscribe on the Hackless YouTube channel. Stay tuned for next episodes of the Hackless Stock. We will get back to you soon with another great episode of the Hackless Stock podcast.
Bye-bye. Right. Thank you.